Hello, hello, ladies and gentlemen. We are going into Impetus for our first matchup in this Zerg versus Zerg situation, Nablime against Jackie Langsky, the latter player in the bottom left, the former player in the top right. That's Nablime, the orange Zerg. Jack is an interesting color. It's beige. I never would have guessed beige, but maybe it's now permanently seared into my brain. And they're referencing none other than Londier, because, um... I'm not sure why. I guess Alexander was uh, watching this particular game. Uh, this is indeed on Impetus, a map by Vic7. It's not Fata Morgana, a map by Vic7, a map by Vic7, but it is Impetus, a map by Vic7, by the way, 12. Maybe question mark and a bunch of parentheses. And yes, Lundier indeed does go only Warden and Envoy. By the way, if you guys are uh, watching this, then you guys includes Nablime because he always watches the casts and especially games that feature him. And I just wanted to mention the word Purifier because apparently he thinks that's the name of a unit in Cosmonarchy. Pfft, what kind of lunatic would name a unit Purifier? It's going to be a low ground Hatcherosk here for Jack Yelansky. If you don't even know what we're talking about, if you don't even know what this is, this isn't your typical Zerg versus Zerg. This is Cosmonarchy. This is very, very different indeed. We will have a hatch on the high ground here for Nablime. Let's talk a little bit about Cosmonarchy. Let's talk a little bit about what Zerg is all about. So what I like to imagine Cosmonarchy does for players who have never seen it before, but are aware of the... Oh, this is this is a little cute thing here. He, uh, I think he started a unit and then canceled the unit and it made extra LARP. <laughs> I, I wasn't paying attention to how this happened, but that does happen sometimes. If you do it at the magic moment, it can work. So uh, check that out. Uh, but anyway... The, uh, the, the And you cancel an egg, and it gives uh, you the larva back, so that's how that happens. Um, yeah, yeah, a little bit of XDs in the chat there. If we can get some XD comments, that would be nice, too. But yeah, Cosmonarchy, it's, um, it basically makes all of the races themselves, only more so. This is a really great quote about the Japanese from uh, Hardcore History, Dan Carlin, who says, The Japanese are like everybody else, only more so. That's like a quote that he found through history, so it's not technically from him, but it, he's where I learned the quote from. And... Anyway, the uh, the cute thing about that is, as it pertains to Zerg, Terran, and Protoss and Cosmonarchy, they're like Zerg, Terran, and Protoss were in StarCraft 1, only more so. They are more like themselves. So what do we mean by that? It means that Zergs swarm a little bit more. It means that Terran have more, uh, they, they become more Terran because they lift off all their structures instead of just a couple of them. And they have the uh, whole deployment thing being a, a cornerstone of their technology and the things that happen in them. And the Protoss, well, I, I, we don't really have to talk about Terran or Protoss now because this is a ZBZ, but just to give you some idea of what we're talking about here. So this new unit, the Quasilisk, it's a, a something that comes a two per egg, just like the Zethrocord, the Zergling. And the main thing that you want to point out or watch for when it comes to the Quasilisks are their uh, ability to fight from, uh, you know, fight workers, fight uh, me melee units, anything that w has limited armor, like the Zethrocore has no armor, the obviously the workers have no armor, certain structures have limited armor, like the Terran Anchor, the bunker replacement, is a, a one armor structure. And so they're not going to be heavily reduced in power versus those. Even the Hydralisk has one armor, and that's something because it helps versus the Quasilisk since it attacks... Uh, actually, it is 2x6. You can hold shift for more information about these things, like the tooltips. You even get to see their weapon range preview. Isn't that cool? We've got a lot of quality of life stuff in Cosmonarchy. But it's worth pointing all that stuff out because uh, the move, move out here uh, from Jack is actually going to be a little bit of a surprise. Uh, Nablime did scout the Kagrant coming down, but it was canceled, and then he went and harvested with that worker. That gave him a little bit more economy than maybe uh, Nablime is thinking of. It, it probably won't be that catastrophically significant in this particular matchup. We do have 12, by the way, for uh, for Nablime. However, his uh, Zeths are going to get popped, or at least one of them will be. And it looks like this fight was, you know, better positioned for Nablime in the early stages of the game. So now he's going to see if he can hunt down across the bridge. We do have more and more reinforcements coming. Remember, Nablime also has the uh, advantage in terms of production, but he's making workers behind this. So he's not actually going to have the same level of reinforcements that his opponent does. And we see on the production tab up there, there's actually a Larvosk Seasiant on the way. This uh, never happens. It's very expensive right now. I'm pretty sure I'm going to be dropping the gas cost at some point soon because Cosmonarchy is getting active uh, support, maintenance, balance updates, etc. Certainly a lot of content updates coming with the uh, tutorials and such that we're working on. 
And uh, the reason why it's it's worth to point out that the Larvasca is here, this is going to be a very big surprise. But what th one thing it does allow for is if you're in a ZBZ fight, if you're in a fight where you're not spending your Vespine because you're busy slamming out minerals on workers, on uh, on quasis, maybe it's a little bit worth to go for the Larvasque because even though it's 125 gas, it's almost no minerals compared to the, it's like half the mineral cost of the Hatcherosk. So you can get it operational faster in terms of time and also easier in terms of your mineral spend expenditure little blood splatters all over the bridge we love to see that now Nablime does indeed uh have a tech structure coming up the hydrothen is on the way uh, we have a hydrothen for his opponent as well it's going to be a little bit slower but the fact that uh jack has this ability to put down the larvosks instead is is not a bad shout right it's not not a terrible idea he does have a couple idle workers he's gonna have to get to it uh but uh you know he could probably also drop a couple of additional uh, circuits or something like that. Uh, obviously, Nablime here has the bit of a map control going up to four hatches, so he'll once again have the larva advantage. The larvasque is equivalent to a hatch in terms of larva production. So that's why it costs so much Vespine, is because it's it's a it's a hatch, but you spend gas to get it, and it's obviously more space efficient for all that matters for Zerg. I mean, they, they don't have building space uh, problems like the other races do, so the fact that they have a more space efficient one is kind of a meme anyway. But, uh, you know, well, may maybe we'll think about uh, making structures bigger for, you know, in the future when we have the ability to render out good quality building graphics on a more liberal level. Because only recently have we had any updates to that. And look at this, instantaneous ski-backed scab. So this is a, a tier one and a half step, and the Avaleth will scout it here for Nablime. Uh, he'll be able to click on it and see the wireframe change. Uh, so he's going to be well aware at this point that uh, ski-backed is on the way. The response is for the uh, quasis to move out for Jack. He does have a decent number of them, right? Something like 20, 21. No, 20. And the reason why that's significant is because it is going to force out some static defense circuits, the uh, Sunken Colony. It's very, very good versus Quasis because they have three armor. Whereas the Hydra is very, very efficient versus armor. So that's something to keep in mind. Now the Zorkish Shroud coming as well. This is going to help clean house versus things like the uh, the Quasis. I'm not so sure what its point is versus air, but I guess if you have enough Hydras, then you should be okay because the Ski Back is often used to afford things like the... Uh, the Scythra core. But I think, judging by the Hydra production, extra hatch coming as well, uh, so Jack is going to maintain parity in terms of the larva count. I think we're actually going to see quasi-backed, a uh, Bactalisk, which is a mutation of the Hydralisk. So you can get that, and you can basically get these bounce attacks that hit units behind them. And the Hydra only has one armor, so it's actually not so bad. It looks like these uh, nice little placements here are going to stop any workers from trying to expand for Jack. His unit's filtering in and getting sniped from the high ground. When you have high ground advantage, you actually have plus two weapon range, and that's very, very different than uh, what it was in StarCraft 1, where it's just kind of like 50% chance to miss, which uh, we thought was very lame. So we removed all that RNG stuff. A Hydra hunting around looking for the Quasilisk, and it is indeed going to uproot the, the Quasi. You can see Hydras have increased weapon range uh, over the Quasi. So that that Quasi was on hold position, trying to you know stop any, any workers from doing any shenanigans, like building a base. And we do have a little bit of a split focus here for Jack. He was trying to set up that uh, base at 9 o'clock, or uh, maybe 8 o'clock is more uh, accurate term. And anyway, he's, uh, he's now getting hunted down through the middle of the map. He doesn't actually have any Bactalisks, so he has not leveraged his tech advantage from the ski back. The uh, evolution of that Hydrath then allows you to make two additional units. One of them you mutate from the Hydra, the Bactalisk, we already talked about that. The other one is an air unit called the Scyther Core, and neither of them have actually been made right now. But, you know, by the same token, the uh, the Zorkish Shroud is done by a Nablime. That's this little flower-looking structure over here. And uh, that structure has not been actuated either. So those are both pretty heavy gas expenditures in the early stages of the game. And with Nablime, you know, hunting in through here, it looks like he's now going to make some Zor use. Okay, he did make one unit. I tell a lie. A couple of units coming in here. Uh, they Hydras do very well versus these because they ignore the armor. But still, it's really good for engaging. Now, unfortunately for Nablime, his focus is a little bit split as reinforcements are coming in from the natural of Jakulansky while the rest of his attack force was up towards 8 o'clock, and it's going to swing on down and just mop the floor. So it's a Hydra fight. We never see this in Brood Wars EVZ, but it happens pretty frequently these days in Cosmonarchy. We'll have to see what the reaction is now that Jack has thoroughly wiped out Nablime's forces, and he's got a little bit of tempo on this third base, although Nablime also has 12 o'clock operational. So I don't think either player is really in a decisive spot. I think we're pretty normalized as far as our gameplay is concerned here. I don't think we're, we're too worried about one player being super fragile versus the other, but Jack does have a little bit of tempo over here, although Nablime has the decided worker advantage. So we got to keep that in mind here. I would say Nablime is ahead on the economy, but their um, their composition, their their tech is fairly even, right? And yeah, sure, Jack is uh, not using his ski back, whereas Nablime is using his shroud, but you know, that's that's pretty much it. We are probably going to see a hatch a little bit further close, but it uh, looks like Jack didn't want to spend the minerals. He didn't have that many in reserve. 
Avalith going to come on back in, sweep out, see what's happening over here. This ga this base is double gas, right? And you compare that over here, it's just gas and ridge. Ridge gives you less resources than the gas does, the, the geyser does. So when you see double geyser, uh, you see your opponent specifically trying to go for something like that. It might be because Jack is looking to tech rush, or it might be because he wants to spend his Vespian on expensive units like this, the Bactalisk, and then see if he can take decided advantages on the cliffs. I would be a little bit wary of going uh, mutating all of your Hydras here, though, because again, the Bactalisk doesn't have great armor penetration. It has good performance versus things like, uh, funnily enough, Hydras, if you can you know, have a front line for them. Uh, if it's like Bactal Hydra versus just Hydra, the Bactal Hydra does win. But the Azorius can absolutely shrug off a lot of the attacks here, because if we, if we look at the stats, it's gonna be a 2x7 attack, and that is actually going to turn into 2x4 because there is no armor pen. So the Zorius with three armor is only going to be taking about four damage. Now we do see the uh, army move out get spotted here by Jack. So he is going to be more than capable of dealing with the situation. He's called the bluff that this Avalith doesn't have anything in it. You can transport from the word go. There's no upgrades in Cosmonarchy. So you just have all of the features of the unit as soon as you make it. And we replace the role of upgrades by just having it so that these units ha unlock more power based on uh, specialists that you can train later on in the game. And by having like 150 units in the game. So there's plenty of exploration to be had. Even even in mirror matchups. So far though, neither player really gonna be gunning it for uh, anything in particular. We do have the Shroud coming now for Jack. So he's gonna e equalize that particular tech. But Nablai, meanwhile, is banking up a lot of resources. Now, 900 Vespine is the requirement to get to tier two for Zerg. Uh, the mineral requirement here is much lower. So we're gonna have to wait and see. It looks like this Avalos will finally get got, but uh, oh, actually it narrowly avoids death, which is kind of funny. Z uh, Zets are gonna charge out forward and just see what's going on over here. And uh, we should be seeing that tier two dropped at any point, but Nablime is uh, a little bit wary of like, sort of he's just sharking around in the middle of the map. He's not actually spending his money just yet. Having a, a pretty big float. I wonder if he was, sometimes he, he types to people on Discord in the middle of uh, his games. And I wonder if that was happening here. But uh, nonetheless, he will finally smarten up and get his tech down. Looks like he was gonna go for a fourth base. Very, very nice movement with the Zets to give uh, Jack some map control. And now he's sharking outward to see if he can st stab in into the middle. Alexander, meanwhile, is ha falling asleep. He usually ends up doing that. So he'll be out, and uh, it'll just be you and I, viewer, to see what happens in this exciting ZVZ matchup. We do have five Skithra cores. Now, they're not super good in a heads-up fight uh, because Hydras can really swat them out of the sky. But maybe there's a world where they can maybe stab in over here, ignore a Spraith to kill a couple of workers or whatever. Now, uh, this restab over here is going to clean house on the right side. You can see that uh, if there's going to be an expansion attempt, it's got to be escorted. The skits are going to fly on over and they will indeed cause a little bit of mayhem for Nablime. He's wondering where he should shark his army towards. He's, he's kind of ignoring the uh, threat of them just stabbing in here and killing all the workers. Watch the resources while this is happening though, because all of the, like we look at the camera positions here on the minimap, you can see uh, Jack is very focused on killing workers here. And it's not a bad idea, right? You do have obviously have the split uh, damage and now the Zets are kind of blocked the Hydras from being able to get in there. I don't see how many workers died. It looks like a, an okay amount, but we, I mean, Jack is actually ahead in workers, which is very surprising, uh, but it wasn't because of that. That just added insult to injury. So the Quasis over here are gonna do their best. Uh, we have a bit of a counterattack starting to be fomented here, and Nablime has achieved tier two. He is gonna be jumping straight up to the Matraval Nest, which is sort of his trademark structure. And that's the critical difference here. Jack spent a lot of Vespian on those Skithra cores, and also on the Bactalisks, and he's even making more. So he's got nothing in the bank for tier two. He's banking that he can just hold out long enough on an economic advantage with tempo on the fourth base, which he does have, and see if he can isolate, you know, into some sort of situation, but he hasn't been able to punish this location. And this location is the most attackable situation. He's taken the safe base. Jack has the safe base. It's up here on the cliff. And he's gonna have really good spacing with his army because some of the Bactalisks are gonna be off there, but they're not, they're on a move command. This is a big mistake from Jack. So he's gonna change his t tune a little bit, getting surrounded on the right-hand side. Again, this is where the zoom out feature would come in real handy if we had it, but unfortunately we do not. Now the Hydras are just gonna get surrounded. There's more reinforcements streaming in from the Blime. It does look like he's gonna wipe the army on the low ground, but is he really? Because we do have some reinforcements coming in. Now, most of them are quasis. And as these Bactalisks die, they turn back into Hydras and they can engage with these forces because that's the regression mechanic we added in a long time ago. And that mechanic allows you to, if you made the unit, instead of making it from a larva, you made it from a, another unit, it turns back into that unit, just like the structures. If you destroy this circuit, it becomes back a, a Kagrant. It, you kill the sunk and it comes into a, a creep colony again. That's uh, for Brood War players. So this is a really, really strong situation for Jack. He does have tempo. He's making a lot of tier one units. And meanwhile, Nablime has spent a lot of his... Re, uh, resources on what? 
He's, he's been adding uh, tier two units instead of adding more Hydras. So he is actually going to end up losing this 12 o'clock location almost certainly. He cannot hold it. The Vilgoracor, which has a nice little passive that leaves behind this small little uh, Dark Swarm type behavior. Oh no, some of these other expensive units hatching over here as well. The control group's not really in, there, in it for uh, Nublime. He's not even exa evacuating his workers. So yeah, I think he got surprised by how much tier one power Jack Yelensky had. He will absolutely get ransacked over here, and some of his units even going to get picked. Again, the Carapace Swarms are, are kind of good for shield absorbing some of that damage, but unfortunately for him, he ends up losing a lot of it. And now this uh, nine, that, that 3 o'clock base could be focused down, but Jack just wants to go for the jugular and finish the job. He's got a lot more units streaming on in, intercepting those reinforcements that are coming in from that eight, uh, 3 o'clock position. The Convalesque doing a lot that it can to uh, deal with some of the Rilla Rokors. And the Stutter stepping in for Jack, is he's trying to get in, but I don't think it's actually enough. When those Vilgorokors die, they turn into these Vilgoluts, and that creates all of those brood spawn that you see there. That was a beautiful, beautiful hold from Nublime, and I think Jack just... He wasn't expecting the Vilgorokors to still be useful after they died. So his rest of his army is going to strew about in the middle. But he did do a very, very good move of shutting down this 12 o'clock base. His 6 o'clock, on the other hand, is operational. We've got a lot of workers in production. He does have to worry a little bit about potentially being caught out of position. If this army gets wiped, then Nablime has carte blanche to move around. Now, most of these really Rokors are going to end up dying if they stray too far from the uh, the rest of the army here. The Convalisks are what empower them. Uh, but yeah, you can see the Hydra stack here is going to be more than enough. There's not really that much here that can be done for Nablime. But still, he's forcing an evacuation from, from Jack. I think Jack is now second-guessing his power. He should snipe down that Vilgoleth, but he doesn't. Okay, now he does. Okay, so he's going to only be dealing with minimal uh, Rilla Rokors thanks to that Convalisk, which is now going to get focused down, but there's going to be enough Hydras in here to overwhelm this position. The, the Zethercores flanking on in are not going to be enough. They're on a, a rally point anyway. So uh, not exactly the most efficient usage of his uh, units here. And there's even a couple of Straggler Vilgoracors up in the main there for Nablime. So he's going to swat out the pesky units that are trying to stream into his main. A couple Zets over here could maybe tickle these uh, workers and cause some problems, but uh, bottom right is being heckled by a single uh, Zero Core. Not the most, uh, you know, strong fighters, but uh, still able to do a little bit of, of deeps. Unfortunately, it's right clicked onto the hatch, so that's not going to work out too well. And here come the Zets doing exactly what I was just saying. I don't think they got a single kill. That's unfortunate. <laughs> the Zets are, uh, they can be a little bit underpowered if you're uh, not focusing on them and, and sort of kiting back and forth. Oh no, what's happening over here? What's going on? Oh, okay, never mind. I thought these Hydras were actually Jacks. I was like, wait, was Jack attacking his own hatch? But uh, no, Jack attack is not exactly the case. Okay, so these Hydras are, are going to help this. The hatch might fall. Depends on Jack's micro here. And he's kind of like allowed his units to get stutter step there. So that's actually a kind of a win for uh, Nablime. Uh, but is it going to be enough, right? Because, again, Nablime is behind. He's spending all of his money on Tier 2 stuff without really having a good complement of Tier 1. Maybe that's a little bit different now. All of the uh, Zets are going to charge on him, but they were right-clicked onto a unit that died, so then they kind of cancel their target instead of being on a, an attack move. The Hydra's over here sniping a Vilgoracor. That's actually not a bad shout. I mean, they're they're expensive and lumbering units. They're very slow. If you, if you can snipe them, then they don't really have that force multiplier factor that they otherwise would have. And wisely, Nablime is able to stabilize over here onto that 3 o'clock location. 12 still up and running now that he's uh, replaced the hatch. So it's still 4 base to 4 base. This bottom right is now being taken finally for Jack in some element of peace. We've got some Izero cores up and running. Do we have anything else being produced? 25 Izero cores, by the way. <laughs> Okay, we'll see, because uh, he, he has some tier 2 static defense coming online over here, which isn't bad, uh, and it is going to maybe force the uh, trigger to be pulled here for Jack, uh, as uh, Nablime is going to charge up to that position, uh, and looks like we even have some advanced workers over here, they were doing their thing as well. So Matrolets are finally out, so these uh, provide Ensnaring Brood as an aura, and it looks like he's going to try to infest the circuit, which is successful, so he's going to start taking control of the Zerg in this location. Uh, we do love to see this sort of interaction, but it looks like, once again, his, his units, just like Jack's earlier, were like right clicked onto something and that target died or changed allegiance and now that they've got to be micromanaged a little bit more heavily but the really road course the, the stack of really road course is increasing but that's what the izero cores are for great pickup here from jack Elensky to see if he can do it himself and he's got his own convalisks spawning his own really road cores using the hp pools of his opponent to uh, good use yeah putting the putting them to good use he's got more and more reinforcements screwing in the hatch has completely fallen though so this base is completely negated and jack 
is he he's he's kind of gotten into the mirror matchup sauce he's only made units that nabim has also made so what are his uh, eff efficiencies here where is he going to get more efficiency he needs more units if he's going to do that a horde of zethrocores is charging on in to that bottom right and six o'clock location while the rest of the army is probably going to flank and pincer this natural really this could looks like a, a killing move it feels like it's really going to be quite difficult for jack to recover from this position he doesn't have hardly any vespine he was capping his geysers which slows down your economy for a short amount of time and he is going to have to call gg thanks to nablime's excellent bounce back wow a back and forth zvz if i've ever seen one well we got a post one for nablime we love to see him in action as the uh, more I would say, like, he, he was looking a little dire. It was looking a little risky for him in that match. I thought Jack had a really strong time, and uh, it's definitely an opportunity there for him to take a, a map. But, uh, hey, we got to go back for the rematch, so join us for tomorrow's VOD, where we'll be taking a look at yet another game between these two GGs. Eh, who am I kidding? Let's just go into game number two. Why not? Why not, guys? We got a lot of games to get through, and if I put uh, one game per video per day, uh, we're just never going to get through the ball. So we might as well sandwich in a little bit of extra content in there. So, uh, yeah, forget what I said about the, this being the only game. Let's move into game number two. Uh, and Nablime already starting off here. We have the same spawns as before, bottom left, top right. Nablime, still the orange Zerg. Jack is no longer beige, though. He's like snow. Yeah, okay, cool. And uh, it looks like there's some words of wisdom, some words for improvement out of our Nablime man. And it uh, looks like they're talking about practicing, improving, etc. And uh, yeah, I mean, listen, I think I think Jack's got a really good shot of qualifying to the next tournament, Acropolis number one's battlement stage. I feel like he's, he's looking pretty solid. He's practicing a lot. His next match is against Art of Turtle, who has also been thinking about the game a lot, maybe not practicing as much. Uh, but, you know, maybe there will be some ideas. Give I, I actually think they, let's see, they play in a couple of, maybe when one of these videos goes live with the ZBZs will be the day of their game. I'm not 100% sure on that, but I'm pretty sure that's the case. So, yeah, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, maybe this particular, oh my God, Jack, Jack, relax, relax your, your minimap. What are you signaling to me, Jack? Maybe don't relax. Maybe do it again and I'll try to pay attention to see if there's a pattern. He has a, a pool coming. Okay, it's it's a fairly, uh, you know, hot, mirrored opener to the last match. They're running it back so far. Hatch by the ramp for Nablime, pool after. And for Jack, it's hatch on the low ground and pool after. We'll see if he ends up going for the Larvosk again. It was only one Larvosk. So, you know, we'll have to wait and see on that. Nablime typing some more. Getting some more typing in. I'll get some sips in. <sighs> Big fan of sips. We love sips over here in the No Frauds Club. Take some sips, get some sips. Mostly of coffee, if you like coffee and you got some extra to spare, send us some cash money in the bottom right link. That's right, bottom right of the screen. This is an interesting take from Nablime. He says, uh, says don't play before your match. I think uh, Shambler was telling me too about his his moves. Shambler's another one of our players who plays often and I would say is like in the, in the top class of players that we currently have. Uh, waiting for Hepsea to post an angry comment about Shambler being terrible. But uh, <laughs> the, the thing that, that gets me about Shambler is uh, one of the things that he, he was telling me uh, as a little bit of a cheeky move over here to see if he can put a, a proxy down. Um, Shambler said that he likes to practice and then for like 90 minutes before the game, he likes to take a break and just sort of like Lay in bed and think about the match that he's about to play. Think about the openers in his head. What is he going to do? And, you know, I got to say, like, I didn't say it in the moment, but goddamn, if you feel like you're taking it that seriously as a competitor about my game, I must have done something right. So I, I felt like that was a dub for me. I talk about, oh, that play was a dub for Dublin. This one was a, a win for Jack. Well, that, hearing that was a win for me, so and a win for everybody else who's been contributing to this project. I, I, people take it seriously enough that before their tournament games, they actually just disengage entirely and just think really hard about what to do. That's pretty cool. We'll see if Jack has been thinking about really hard about what to do. He's got the quasi-advantage, but only fleetingly, as six more are on the way. Can he get a good engagement off and thin the herd over here is the first question. His focus fire is leaving a lot to be desired, but three of them are about to pop at the same time. So, okay, it looks like Nablime has held this just fine, as we would have expected. Maybe with a, with good target fire and a good first engagement, he might have been able to steal away a little bit of an advantage. Obviously, the closer reinforcement point means that Nablime would have been just fine. 
And you can see the double circuit. I mean, Jack is totally fine here as well. He's taking the cliff advantage. He's going to be using it to pelt his opponent if he tries to commit up the natural. And this is what you have to do to be safe. I think you could probably get away with just one circuit. I don't think you needed the second one. But maybe he's fearing like a super flood. And uh, he's actually behind this. He's okay. It makes a little bit more sense now. He's not producing that many combat units in response to this. He's, he does have four more quasis coming, right? But uh, each one of those is a pair, remember. Uh, but the Hydra then is the, the main thing here. And it looks like he will be going for the Larvosk again. So this is interesting, right? Because it, it again, it, it opens up faster than the hatch. You can build it faster, but you have to actually mutate it, right? And so it's 125 gas right now. I'm waiting to actually make the change that I was talking about of, of reducing the gas cost to see if anybody actually makes use of it and is it actually OP or something, right? Because I don't want to make it like even more overdetermined that you should always do that. In my mind, it would be ideal if it's a choice between spending your gas on your production and spending your minerals on your production in the early stages of the game. Now, right now, it seems like people just make the choice to make hatches, but Jack is over here trying to innovate. His Hydrothen is already done. Compare that to Neblimes, who is a little bit further behind on that. And uh, it looks like we should be good to drop a couple extra production for Jack if he wants to. Oh, he's actually loading up for a quasi drop. Okay. This is interesting. He's made his own Avaloth. This is a lot of Vespine expended, right? Oh, look at that. That Zeth going to get bopped immediately. And maybe this uh, Avaloth will have been sighted as a result. He's going to immediately scramble his quasis over. He doesn't know that there's anything in it. But I, I like this burrow. I mean, I would like it better if you weren't using a detector transport to, to walk in and just see the the, the quasilisks <laughs> burrowed there. But if it wasn't that, okay, he, he catches it on the on the end. If he clicked on it, he would have seen this text here that says, oh, you have six obeliths, right? Or six uh, quasilisks. So since he sees him making a beeline, I would be very surprised if he leaves his main uh, completely undefended, but he's got more hatches on the way. We have one more coming for Jack as well, who is... Uh, producing additional workers right now. And here's the push. Uh, that's really unfortunate. I'll, no, no other way to say that. There, that's a, that's an unfortunate one, losing all six quasis. I mean, they're not going to be that much of a value add on the ground game. It, once Hydras come out, they kind of outcompete the quasis. Uh, and, and the quasis surge back into relevance a bit later on into the matchup if we end up seeing like mutas, which have pretty low range, or, you know, something like that. But it looks like this game, Neblime, is uh, is looking a lot better, I would say. He's uh, he's looking a lot more ahead of, of things than he was before. So uh, he's, he's got his third base up a lot faster than his opponent. And his opponent doesn't have that many uh, combat units, right? Partially due to that bungled drop. So drop play is always a little bit more high variance. The hatch count is also a lot higher for Neblime. So, you know, in the last game, we saw Jack stay on Tier 1 for a very long time and then use the fact that Sort of like a Protoss player getting carriers in StarCraft 1. Their weakest, their ground army is like at the most vulnerable when it's the carriers aren't there yet, right? Because you're still massing up the number and you don't have the resources to put into the ground army. So that's kind of like where Neblime was at in the last game with the, the Iral Iris and then the following tech afterwards is that he didn't really have a lot of resources to spend on power units with Vespine. So he didn't have a, a big Hydra count. He didn't have any Bactalisks. He didn't even have the Ski Bact, right? So he was sticking to uh, tier one, then uh, like, like flat tier one with no uh, stab into the tier one and a half with uh, the pool or den upgrades. And, uh, he, you know, in this situation, he's just got so much more than what he had last game. And the attack is also hitting a lot differently, right? So Jack is going to come up here and get his entire ground army wiped a second time. Uh, and this is really rough for him, right? So he doesn't really have that much uh, left over to hold versus a push. He does have the double circuit. And he's going to make some Bactyls. That takes, uh, I want to say, like 30 seconds or so, maybe a little bit less, like 28, 25, something like that. So I think they'll be ready in time, and he can get onto the high ground and hold. But this is a three, uh, three base Zerg with Neblime's third coming up online with some static defense already set up and great coverage on the map to, to know that his opponent doesn't have a third base. I mean, he doesn't technically know it's not in like one of these hidden spots, but probably isn't, right? And the reason I bring all that up to the forefront is that Jack is spending a lot of Vespine just to stay alive, and he's already down eco, right? So if he can take and hold the, the 8 o'clock position again, okay, maybe we can get into talking about whether or not this is going to be a, a, a live game. But right now, it does look like Neblime is just going to use his macro machine to crunch. And the Bactyls aren't even on the high ground. He could just come in straight up and kill this. Like, you have to really respect the Hydra count. He's got 19. Neblime himself is giving too much respect to this fight. He could just mop, mop floor uh, with the circuits. And he can be close enough to the Bactyls that they aren't going to bounce too much. But it looks like right now, he's, he's content to contain. Zets are making it out or trying to. I see Record coming on down, but it's on a... A, a, a Chad move. I was going to say it's on a regular move instead of an A move, but let's be honest. Just look at it. He's a Chad. 
And look at this, has he been baited in, right? Jack does have his army out. But again, you can just walk right in and, and snipe the backdolls. I don't know if you even need to do that. So, okay, he gave a little bit more respect when he didn't need to, and he gave way too little respect when he did need to. But again, is, is it right to say he needed to? I actually don't think that's true. Yeah, sure, the contain's been broken, but the economy's online for Deblime. He's got 30 additional workers, or 20 additional workers, mind you, uh, and he's 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 gunning it as far as the third base is concerned. That, that's basically a fully saturated mineral line. He's got the gas and ridge mined. So I think he's all good. I don't think he's really in, in a, a bad spot whatsoever. He's adding a little bit more defenses. He's putting down a random hatch in the middle of the map that's going to help him contain this bridge so it's not so random, and he's getting tier two. So everything going the way of Nablime, he's going to go the conservative approach of ending the game. Uh, his opportunity to bust with the Hydras is now over. So let's see what he can do. There were, there were. It, it's important to also say that there were reinforcements on the way for, uh, for Jack. So like, he did have more units coming from the the hatches and stuff. But there's still an opportunity to deal crippling amounts of damage in that situation. And look, this quasi is even going to deny an expansion. Uh, one one thing I think players are going to start doing versus higher skill enemy players is they are going to clear this out before they send the worker because losing the worker, losing the tempo on the third base when you're already behind is really crippling. So Jack can Im significantly improve that particular part if he just clears out this spot. He's going to do it again, but there's already a Quasilisk over here at, uh, at 6 o'clock, and that's not even the base you want to take if you're in Jack's shoes anyway. He's going to see if he can stab on in here, but there's two circuits. There's actually four, and there's some Hydras over here. The big flank is coming in from the other side. This is actually really good for the Bactyls, but there's only two of them. So they're not really going to be super efficient. However, it's still going to be more than enough to mop the floor with the Zets. And this is where I was talking about, right? If you go Zeth, Hydra, Iziracore, you start filtering in Quasis on the other side of that. The Quasis destroy the Zets, and then there's no front line. So the Azir cores get focused down by the Hydras and the Bactyls can kind of like hold the Hydras at bay. This is where the Zoryus comes in, sort of like a poor man's Vilgoracore in some ways, where it does provide you a little bit of Vilgoracores. Yet again, the space uh, not being able to be taken. He's actually put a hatch up a little bit further ahead, so kind of Nablime Mask with the trying to hold the bridges and such, right? It's a little bit far away, but you can imagine that happening later on in the game. He is taking 8 o'clocks. So, okay, so Jack is kind of... Uh, I'm not sure exactly if I would say that he's in a favored position. I don't think he's fought back enough for that. But he's doing okay in a, in a bad position, and uh, he's been able to take some surprising fights uh, with Nablime flanking with two uh, low-power armies and uh, being slapped around a little bit on the way out. So, you know, we like to see that. There's an attempted counter, uh, like, watch, if you will, with the Zets kind of, like, moving around. We don't have any coverage on the top left for Jack. But you can see, like, the bases are still, like, of interest, right? Our players are sending, like, a couple of units here and there. There's no supply in Cosmonarchy, so you don't have to worry that, like, oh, I'm going to put two units at each base, and that's going to make my army under strength uh, irreversibly or irrevocably. So you can see here, this hatch is going to get focused down. He will have to cancel this. Looks like he's not even going to be able to. And now this hatch up here can get killed. And his army was just massively out of position. So Jack is going to end up losing a lot of tempo at 6 o'clock. And, you know, it's all right. You know, it's not, it's not going to, you know, make the game... You know, any easier for him to win, obviously, but uh, it didn't necessarily. It wasn't necessarily the death knell. I, I think the question is like, what is the reaction? What is the composition here for Nablime? He loves the Matravel Nest. He loves g using the Matrolets to create the uh, the Vilgolets and also to apply ensnare on all of his units. So he he, he does love those spe specialist units. He also has taken a liking to the Vilgoracore lately. I don't know if it's the most efficient composition uh, to to stop what Jack is doing, but still, Jack has a lot of units. So we got to keep that in mind. Jack has the, uh, he doesn't have the advantage in any of the numbers, but he's kind of caught up in workers. And Nablime has not taken a fourth base. So, you know, there's something to be said for if he gets this uh, six o'clock base up and he can hold versus these fights with these, his uh, Bactolus count. Once again, Jack can maybe threaten in the, in the mid game. I'm really liking what I'm seeing from Jack. I think he's, he's proving to be a, a tenacious player where if you don't just outright kill him in the early game, I think he can do things. So there's a couple of, uh, I think those were Avalots. I'm not sure. Maybe those were Matrolots. I don't see the Matrolots up anymore. That might have actually been a critical uh, whiff there from Nablime where he just kind of like right-clicked them in the wrong location or something. Maybe he wasn't expecting the space to already be up. You can see Nablime's army kind of sharking around to see can it affect change anywhere else on the map. He's got a couple of Hydras burrowed over here. It doesn't look like Jack is aware of that. So he's going to stab in here and, and shut down 6 o'clock yet again while taking 3 o'clock for himself. So that's what Nablime's sort of MO here is. Tier 2 just started for Jack. So again, the tech deficit is immense. And there is no shroud here either for Jack. So he doesn't have the ability to go for Lachizalisks to try to deal with all of the brood spawn and the Zeths and stuff. Uh, Lachizalisks are probably an underrated or underexplored 
counter slash solution to when your enemy is relying super heavily on brood spawn to reinforce on the front lines. Because the Rilla Rokors will take full damage from the spines no matter how many Rilla Rokors get hit by the Lakizalisk attacks. And it looks like this is actually going to be an attack that Nablan thinks about taking, but instead he's just going to end up bleeding a couple of units out on the way out. Well, I, I guess Azorius comes out uh, just fine. This force up here holding the base is now going to be pressured. Can the blind bust it is the question, but we got a lot of Hydras. We got a couple of Bactalisks in the back, some of them now getting aggroed up. And the reaction, is it going to actually be... Okay, Jack is maybe overcorrecting a little bit over here. He's not counting on his force to be able to respond to this threat. And I think it makes sense because reinforcements are streaming in from the middle of the map using all of that larva that Jack has built, or Nablime has built up. But this means 6 o'clock is still going to maintain in the domain of Nablime. This one Matrov adding an absurd amount of value to this force, but it has been pushed away by some bounces. The reinforcements now streaming up in. So Jacket looks like it will end up holding. It's hard to call, but I think he's held. The problem is now his natural is besieged. I think at this point, Nablime is going to be able to finish the job. There's 12 Hydras over here, but it's not going to be enough to deal with the overwhelming force that uh, Nablime has. So by golly, G Wiz with the static defenses over here getting slowly overwhelmed by the Vilgora cores, which are very good versus low static defense counts just by themselves. They will sort of attrition it out. And with, uh, yeah, sure, you held your, your th uh, 9 o'clock base, but your natural's busted. You have no way to reinforce. GG's called. The production got on top of Nablime. Going up to a 2-0 start. Well, you'll have to tune in tomorrow for real this time for the future of this cast over set. Are we going to see some, uh, some more life out of Jack? Uh, we are going to be changing maps away from Impetus. But, uh, yeah, just stay tuned on that one because it's going to be pretty based. GG.